question, because you've got to settle this question before you can go forward into anything pertaining to the promises and the blessings of God. Does God want us to be financially blessed? There seems to be some concern about that. There seems to be some confusion about that in some places. Some places believe that God wants you to be poor and pious and, and broke and, and suffering, but the scripture doesn't bear that out. Does God want us to be financially blessed? Yes. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case, what are God's primary motivations for wanting us to be blessed financially? If he wants us to be blessed, that is to say, why? What's his motivation? Well, he's got three of them. Motivation number one, that God wants us to be blessed. He loves us. He loves us and love gives. Don't tell me you love anybody that you're not willing to give anything to. One of the byproducts of love is giving. So the most famous scripture in the Bible, John 3, 16, God so loved. How much did he love? He so loved that he gave. Okay, Because a byproduct of loving is giving. And what did he give? He gave his most valuable thing. He gave the life of his only begotten son. So the first motivation he has for wanting us to be blessed, he loves us. Okay. And he gives because he loves us. Next motivation God has for wanting to bless us. We are his children and he's a good father. Romans eight fifteen says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again under fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, when you trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, you had faith in him, you accepted him, you repented of your sins, you invited him into your heart, you confessed that you believed that he lived and he died and he rose again, not only did your soul get saved, but you were adopted into the family of God and God sees you as one of his own. And he's a good father. Matthew 7, 11 says, Jesus was teaching. He said, if you who are evil or you who have the propensity to do evil, human beings, you know, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? Well, what is he talking about there? The Holy Spirit is an extremely beautiful, extremely valuable gift from God. So if God is not holding back something as valuable as the Holy Spirit, if he's willing to give me the greater, then surely he's willing to give me the lesser, like material things or things that meet my natural needs. Okay. And then uh, finally, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, a father who won't provide for his own is worse than an infidel. And God is not a, uh, a father who won't provide. We are his children. He's a good father. He provides. He wants us to be blessed. And then finally, the third motivation God has for blessing us is God wants us to be a blessing. All right. Deuteronomy 8, 18. Remember the Lord, for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. What's his covenant? Genesis 12 and 2. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And then you are going to be a blessing. That's God's intention. That's his three motivations. Okay. He loves us and love gives. We are his children. He's a good father. And then he wants us to be a blessing. So we know that God wants us to be blessed. We know the motivations behind why he wants us to be blessed. So then let's take this next logical step and ask this question because it's an obvious question. If God loves me, and if God wants me to be blessed, then why am I struggling financially? I knew that wouldn't go over big. You know, that's not a shouting question. Have you ever asked it? You know, have you ever, you know, read the scriptures about God's prosperity and his strength and, and you, you're filled with faith and you hear a good message on prosperity and then you look at your bank account and you look at your bills and you think, what am I missing here? Can we be honest? Can we, is, ain't nobody here but us. Can we just talk? Have you ever wondered if God loves me and if God wants me to be blessed, why am I struggling so bad? 
Why is there always more month than there is money? What is going on in my life? And I want to approach that answer first through the prism, the paradigm, the lens of salvation. I want you to think about it like this. God loves everybody. Okay. Again, John 3, 16, he so loved the world. And God has made a way for everybody to be saved through Jesus Christ. And salvation is not by works, lest anyone can boast. It is by grace. Romans calls it a free gift. And yet, not everybody's going to be saved. Okay. There are people that God loves. Okay, hold this thought in your mind. There's people that God loves that are going to bust hell wide open and suffer for eternity. Why? Because salvation has walls around it. And there's only one gate to get through the wall. And that gate is Jesus Christ. Okay. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes back by me. There are not multiple or many ways to God. There is one. So no matter how much God loves you and no matter how much God had to go through to make salvation available to you, if you do not go through the gate of Christ, you will never access the salvation that's behind the walls. You are completely locked out of it, locked out of it forever, lost for eternity if you do not go through the gate called Christ. That's why he said, I am the door of the sheepfold. All whoever came before me were thieves and robbers. He said, if you try to climb in the window or you try to climb over the roof, he said, you're the same as a thief and the robber. There's one door and Jesus is the door. So all that God has for us concerning salvation, it's got walls around it. Loves us, paid a heavy price to purchase our salvation, and yet he can love you and he can have already paid the price and you still not get it unless you go through the gate. Okay, in the same way, the blessing of God, the prosperity of God has walls around it. Okay, and the gate to get behind the walls, the gate to access all of the blessings behind the walls is obeying Scripture's commandments concerning finances. Okay, so look at that. Okay, look at that. Salvation is tied to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Blessing is tied to obedience of financial commandments. Okay? Th those, those two things, they're beautiful, wonderful things with walls around them and one gate. So if my financial prosperity and my financial blessing is tied to obeying Scripture's commandments concerning finances, I need to find out what those things are, and I need to be careful to obey them. And when it comes to commandments, you can't get a better list of commandments to obey than the good old Ten Commandments, okay? So we're going to look at each one of the Ten Commandments, and we're going to look at it through a financial perspective. I think you'll get some good stuff that will unleash blessing in your life. Ten Commandments of Financial Success. You might want to take notes. Um, I don't know how much we have up here or not. The team's working feverishly, and they're doing a great job. Thank you guys for everything you're doing. Ten Commandments of Financial Success. Number one. Are you ready? Yeah. Say it like you had your coffee. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Put God first. Okay. That's the number one commandment. Put God first. This comes from the first commandment in Exodus 20, where uh, he says, uh, I am the Lord your God. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't put anything before me. Don't put anything in front of me. Put me first. Now let's look at it through the prism of finances. The first financial decision you should make every week should directly relate to putting God first. Okay? If it's not, you're standing on the outside of those walls 
you're not standing in the blessing and prosperity of God. I said the first financial decision you make every week should have to do with putting God first. Listen, a lot of Christians, you ask them what's first in your life, and they'll rattle off a bunch of stuff, scriptures, you know, holy words they learned in church. But, but, but God is first only in perspective. He's not first in practice. Now, that's true for a lot of you. God is first in perspective, in thought process, but he's not first in practice. Why? Because to practice something, you got to get disciplined about it. And you got to be regimented with it. And a lot of us, it's not that we don't love God, it's that we're lazy. If you can't say amen, say ouch, it's okay. Okay? And I'm telling you, there is a discipline to this thing, and there is a heart and a mind connection to this thing where you don't make your first financial decision of the week without establishing, okay, God is first. What's that mean practically? It means before you pay anything, you have set aside your tithe. Okay? First. Because the tithe belongs to God, he said he did. Then, next, you begin to pray and ask the Holy Spirit what you should offer him. That you want to bring God an offering. But you, you handle all of that stuff in the beginning of the week. And you make yourself available. Lord, if I'm in church this week and you desire for me to give something or you desire for me to sow or support a certain project, God, I want, you, I want to let you know I'm available to you. Speak to my heart. But you do all of those things first. Before you budget anything else, before anything else is spent, you establish God's firstness in your life. Well, you sound just like a preacher getting up and telling people who you already acknowledge some were struggling in their finances. you telling them to put God first and come and give more money and come and tithe to the church. You are certainly right. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. Look at this. 1 Kings chapter 17. Verses 10 through 14 says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. Everybody say she was behind the gate. All right. She, or, or, or in other words, she was outside of the gate. She wasn't in the gate. She was outside of the gate. Now, that's prophetic right there. He came to the gate of the city and there was a woman gathering sticks. He called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and he said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said to him, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for my son that we may eat it and die. Verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you've said, but Make me a small cake from it first. I, I, like, I like in the text how it started out a morsel of bread and then it turned into a cake. Sounds just like a preacher. Could you give me a morsel of bread and then the longer he talk, I need, I'm going to need that to be a cake. Go ahead and make me a cake. Okay. He says, bring me a cake from it first. And then afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went, a day, uh, she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry. According to the word of the Lord, it was the word of the Lord, it was the word of the Lord, it was the word of the Lord, which he spoke through or spoke by Elijah. I want you to notice a couple of things in the text. Miraculous provision hit her life when she made the decision to put God first. You got to understand who's talking to her here. Elijah is the prophet of the nation. In other words, he represents the voice of God in the nation. He's carrying God's assignment and God's agenda in the earth. He represents the church. So he walks up to her and he says, go make me something to eat. She says, I don't have anything to give you anything to eat. I'm about to make this little handful of meal for me and my son. We're starving and we're going to die. I want you to look at the audacity of the request. Elijah 
up until this day has been hiding by a brook, being watered by the brook, and being fed twice a day by the ravens. God's sending birds with bread and meat to feed him twice a day. He's well fed. He could use to, to miss a couple of meals. And yet he comes up to a woman who is a widow, who has a child, who is down to her last handful, and he has the nerve to take an offering. Would you bring me a cake? It is not about the widow providing for Elijah. The text is about Elijah providing for the widow by giving her an opportunity to put God first. Giving her an opportunity to go inside the gate into God's supernatural provision. And when she made the decision to put God first, to feed the ministry first, to make sure that was taken care of before she even took care of her own personal need or her son's need, the Bible said that supernatural provision that was inside the gate, God's prosperity, God's provision, God's blessing, it began to erupt in her life. And God touched what she did have left and caused it not to run out supernaturally. God multiplied what she did have. Nobody came to this woman, knocked on her door, and gave her anything. It's just that what she already was in possession of began to grow and multiply. God doesn't need anybody else to come and bless you. If you will put God first, God can make what you already have in your house. I feel the Holy Ghost. What you already have in your hand, what you already have in your bank account, what you already have in your home's equity, God can make it start to multiply and grow when you make the decision to put him first. Also, putting God first establishes you in relationship. <sighs> Putting God first establishes you in relationship with whatever vehicle he's using that you have given through. So watch this. Elijah's the vehicle God's using in the earth. Okay? And he was the one the woman was giving to God through. Okay? And it, it benefited her. She got blessed financially. She didn't have to buy groceries for a year. Okay? So all that money she would have had to spend on groceries stayed in her pocket. She was good. But... That's not the only benefit of putting God first. Because when you put God first, also a relationship, a connection to ministry is established, right? And God will bless you through the conduit of the ministry you are connected to. That's why you ought to stop church hopping and pick a church. Because God will send your blessings through the conduit of the ministry that you are connected to in relationship. So watch this. The woman... She gets her flour blessed and her oil blessed, and they're good. The grocery situation is good. They're thriving in the middle of the famine. But what she doesn't know is her son has a terminal illness. They didn't know it. There was no doctor visits and checkups in this day. But there was something growing on his brain, okay? A massive aneurysm, a massive brain hemorrhage was in the works. And a couple of months after this miracle of provision, the Bible says the child was in the field and he screamed out, my head, my head, and he fell over dead as a doornail. The woman picks up the lifeless boy and takes him back to the relational connection she had established by putting God first. She takes him back to the prophet. Hallelujah. She takes him back to the ministry connection, the ministry relationship she had established with God through the man of God, through the ministry. And she says, what do you have to say about this? And the Bible said Elijah stretched himself over the boy, that he got in alignment on earth so that God's will could be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of a sudden, the prophet stretches hand to hand, nose to nose, foot to foot over the boy and he begins to release his prophetic mantle and his prophetic anointing that God was using in him and all of a sudden not from Elijah he's just the conduit he's just the he's just the earthly thing the stuff is flowing through all of a sudden resurrection power and life begins to flow from heaven 
to Elijah, to the woman's son, and he was raised to life. Why? Because she had a relationship with the ministry portal she used to communicate with the kingdom of God by putting him first. You say, Pastor, it's so bad I can't afford to tithe faithfully. You can't afford not to tithe faithfully. You never know what's going to happen, and you never know when you're going to need somebody to stretch themselves over your life and rebuke the devil and command the power of God, and you want it to flow, and it won't flow if you're outside behind the gate. Somebody say 10 turns it. Point number two, commandment number two, don't worship material things. <sighs> Thank you for that resistance. Now I know I'm on the right track. Don't worship material things. This comes from that second commandment where he said, you shall not make a carved image or a graven image or an idol and bow down and worship it. An idol is any material thing you put before God. Now, I want you to ask yourself this rhetorically. You don't have to answer. Have you ever put a material thing in front of God? Go ahead. Have you ever held back your tithe because you knew you had a car payment coming up Monday? Okay. You hear me? I ain't, I ain't preaching this to grow the church. You don't preach messages like this to grow your church. Messages like this run people off. You preach messages like this when you are committed to seeing the people that stay having their lives changed for the better. Okay? So scowl at me all you want. I ain't scared of you. I'll be here next week. Have you ever let a material possession, you know, the Holy Spirit's moving in a service, somebody's preaching, and, and, and someone gives a seed offering challenge, you know, a project or something that, that you're challenged to sow into. And maybe they say this is for 20 people or 50 people or what, however many it is, and you feel in your spirit, I'm supposed to give into that, but then you check your app And you know that, that you, you, can't, you can't give, you know. If you have to ask your money if you can serve your God, then your God is really your money. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Have you ever bought something you regretted buying? You can answer that. Have you ever had buyer's remorse, you know? You know, you just tried it on at the store and it looked real good in those skinny mirrors and then you got it home to the real mirrors and where did all of those bumps come from? My God. And you just... <laughs> Buyer's remorse, okay? And, and what are, or, or, you know, you're at a restaurant and you, you know, you, you decide to take a whole family out and everybody orders and, and then you get the bill and you're like, oh my God, you know, it wasn't even that good. You just, you're just dying on the inside. And what do you always say? What do you always say? What do you always say? It wasn't worth it. Say that with me. It wasn't worth it. If I say worth all worship means is worth-ship. Worship is the honoring of that which is worthy or worth it. Okay. When God's worth-ship is at the forefront of your mind, you will never be swayed and fooled by material things. 
when it becomes true that God, you, your kingdom, your purpose for my life is worth more than anything else, when that position is established in your heart, it's amazing. Material things lose their hold. I'm not saying you'll never buy nothing. I'm saying it'll be hard to dupe you. It'll be hard to fool you. You know, material things get us because of their false promise of joy and happiness and success and all that. But when you are established in the worship of God and he is your joy and he is your happiness and he is your fulfillment and he is the thing that validates you, material things lose that grip. And so it, it, it makes it hard for you to be a sucker walking through the mall and seeing something that gives you all kind of emotions and flutters and all, I have to have this. When you have him, you don't have to have. Number three, number three, don't use God's name selfishly. This comes from the third commandment. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Now, a lot of preachers have, have limited this to just cussing, you know, using the name Jesus Christ as a cuss word or saying it out of frustration, all that kind of stuff. I, I would certainly agree with that, that that is not something good to do and that you are taking the name of the Lord in vain when you do that, but I don't think it's limited to that. What does the word vain mean? Vanity, conceited, selfish. Using the name of Jesus to put all of your prayer focus on material things more so than spiritual things means that your life is out of balance. Your spiritual life is upside down. You become materialistic in focus. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. The Bible tells us to pray for our needs to be met. It tells us to pray and use the name of Jesus to do that. The Bible even tells us we can pray about our desires. Jesus said himself, whatsoever things ye desire. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. But when your prayer requests are flowing, they'll tell on your heart. Okay. And when you're using all of your faith focus and all of your prayer focus on materialistic things, you know, when you're trying to use the name of Jesus to get a car payment made on a car you never should have bought in the first place, Things are out of balance and it will hinder your prayers. Point number four, be a good steward. This is from Exodus 20 verses 9 and 10 where he says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, is all about stewardship. The stewardship of your time, the stewardship of your work. The stewardship of your energy. The Sabbath law, when he says, okay, you can work for six days, but on the seventh, give me that one. Do not work. Even if you're in a financial bind, don't work on that seventh day. Even if you got something you got to pay, don't work on that, sev that Sabbath, that seventh day. Work for six days and then give me the Sabbath. Come and worship me, read my word, praise my name, then rest for the remainder of the day. Thing. Trusting God with the Sabbath is saying, God, I believe you can do more for my financial life in six days than I can if I worked all seven. Okay. I believe that I'll earn more and I'll have more by not working that extra day and honoring you than I would have if I just worked and stayed in the grind all the way through, okay? Now, this principle is akin, it's connected to the tithing principle. The tither believes, God, because of what your word says and because of my confidence in you, I believe I can go further with 90% by putting you first than I could with 100% and ignoring what your word says about my finances. All good stewards do these three things. You might want to jot these down. They spend wisely. Oh, I knew that would go over. I saw those spinner rims in the parking lot when I drove in. They spend wisely. Okay. They save 
diligently. They give generously. All right. Spend wisely. Elbow your neighbor in the ribs and say, spend wisely. Spend wisely. Oh, glory to God. Spend wisely. You know, some of your children think that Amazon is an uncle. They're at your house so many times a week. Spend wisely. Uncle Amazon, glory to God. Aunt Amazon. Spend wisely. Save diligently. Give generously. Point number five, teach your children. Teach your children. Exodus 20, verse 12, where it says uh, to honor your father and your mother, to obey your parents. Why does God want children to honor their parents and obey their parents? Because parents are the primary teachers about God and life. I'm going to say it again. Parents are the primary teachers about God and life. Listen, both good and bad. Okay? If the child learns bad practices and bad paradigms about God and life, it was taught by the parents. If the child learns good paradigms and practices about God and life, it was taught by the parents. Your children's perspective about money is coming directly from you. Okay. When you're just in the kitchen and you're just spouting off upset about all the things that's going on financially and how much of a struggle and how difficult things have been, you know, and, and you're, you're saying stuff like if we just had the money or we don't have the money, you know, one day we're going to get the money. If you're not careful, you can build a money serving complex into your child. Okay. And that's dangerous because Luke 16, 13 says, no man can serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. And then Jesus identifies the only two masters there are in this world. There's only two. God and mammon. Mammon means money. Okay. So when you look to the source of your security, the source of how you're going to have a strong future, the source of how things are going to be okay, the source of how you're going to be provided for, in everyone's mind, the source of those things, it's either one of two things. It is either God. Or it is money. And whatever paradigm you have about that. See, all this stuff that I'm teaching, this isn't for perspective. This is for practice. Okay? You can shout about the stuff I'm saying and it not benefits you one bit unless it is applied and practiced. What's your real paradigm about money? What's your real communication style about money? What's the temperature of your house when it comes to money? Do you talk to your children about ownership versus renting? Do you talk to your children about interest on credit cards? Do you talk to your children about budgets and about savings? What's the paradigm in the household? Because whatever it is, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it is getting downloaded onto their hard drive. And they'll either have to, they'll either have to overcome it later in their life if it's negative, or they'll be catapulted by it. And the reason this, this commandment about honoring your father and mother, obeying your father and mother is so important is because what God intended to happen, this was the design. We, we did a great job messing it up. But what God intended to happen is for each generation to pass on the good practices and knowledge of the former. So if the parents are teaching their children in this first generation when they first got the Ten Commandments, if they will teach them and the children will honor the parents and receive the lesson, then the children grow up, learn their own things, have their own life experience, and now they got all of their parents' wisdom and their parents' life experience and all of their own wisdom and their own life experience. So by the time it gets to the third generation, that third generation of kids is getting three generations of knowledge taught from one or two parents. Okay, It was meant to be passed down. What are you passing down other than drama, problems, and frustration? Number six. Number six. Oof, y'all thought that one was bad. This one's terrible. It's on the screen. I don't even want to say it. Number six. Live on a budget. Okay. Live 
on a budget. I can stare back at you just as mean as you're staring at me. Don't make me a bit of difference, okay? Live on a budget. Now, this goes along with the sixth commandment. What's the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. How does live on a budget connect to thou shalt not kill? Because when you fail to budget, you kill your financial life. Okay? When we fail to plan, we plan to fail. Proverbs 27, 23, and 24 tells us to know the state of our flocks and our herds, to know what we have in assets, to know what we are required of in liabilities, to budget, to know how much is coming in each month, each week, each day, whatever it is, and how much is going out. And if you're not good at it, a lot of people just aren't good at it, okay? They're not good at putting a budget together. There has never been a time that it's easier. There's all kind of on, free online budget programs. There's all kind of books on budgets. You know, you can just Google financial books about budgets, and it's, it's, a lot of them even are free. It's, it's just insane how much information you have access to if you actually would discipline yourself to care about living on a budget. A budget helps you make financial decisions without emotion. Many of the financial decisions we make are emotional impulse decisions. Uh, so, so if you're not strong enough to bend your will and control yourself, you don't even have to be. If you live on a budget, the budget will dictate whether you can buy the red bottoms this month. The budget will dictate whether you can buy the golf clubs or play golf six times this month. The budget will dictate what's available. You don't even have to get your emotions involved. You leave your emotions out of it, you know? The budget will dictate what is available. Number seven. Number seven. Live below your means. See how these started out good and they're getting worse and worse? I told you it wasn't a church growth message. Live below your means. Listen, what are your means? Listen, it's the current level of provision that God has blessed you with. Let me just help you understand. The job you have, you wouldn't have it if God hadn't blessed you. There are people that went to bed last night healthy and woke up and had a stroke and have no use of the left side of their body this morning. It don't matter how gifted you are, how much money you make, how long you've been in the field, you couldn't do anything if God had not blessed you to be able to do it. So listen, whatever amount of money that you're making that you're bringing in from your labor or your investments or your business or whatever, okay, what that really is is that's the amount of provision God has assigned to your life at this stage. Now listen, we can always believe God for more. We can always believe God for increase. Believing for increase every day, that's great. I want you to do that. What I'm saying is, until the increase comes, live within the boundaries of the provision that God has established you at. Okay? What commandment of the Ten Commandments does this go along with? Thou shalt not commit adultery. How does living above your means connect with not committing adultery? They're really the same thing. It's just one's in the flesh and one's in, in the area of finances. What do you do when you commit adultery? You look at God and you say, I'm not satisfied with the spouse you sent me. I'm not happy with the one you provided for me. 
I don't want to use what you gave me. I want to go above, outside, and beyond of the provision that you blessed me with. You didn't do a good job. You didn't give me enough. I'm not happy. I want more. So because you didn't give it, you didn't do it, I'm going to step outside of what you gave me. I'm going to go on my own and get it for myself And you do the same thing just in a financial sense when you live above your means. I'm not happy with what you blessed me with. I'm not content. I need that stuff over there. You didn't give me enough to go and get that stuff over there. So I'm going to go outside of what you've given me and go chase down that thing because I want it for myself. I'm going to make myself happy. When a person lives above their means, they are announcing to God and everyone else in their life that they are not content. Okay. There's two reasons people live above their means. First one, they are not content. When you buy things you can't afford, you're announcing to God that you are not content with what he's given you. Now, a lot of you will say, ooh and ah, and my God, pastor, preach that, but you're not content in your life in some areas right now. So let me show you a powerful scripture because I'm not just preaching to the people that are shouting and saying amen. I'm preaching to everybody. I want you to see this scripture. Look at Philippians 4, 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be. Let me ask you something. What do you think the golden key word in that verse is. Okay? That's, that's not wrong, but l stare at it. Okay, stay. That's okay, but, but stare. Stare at the text. Read it in your mind. What? What? You, so who said learned? Who said learned? Raise up your hand. Oh, you good students. Did you know that being content is a learned behavior. You don't start out content. God, I wish somebody would teach us this about our marriage relationships, about our jobs, about our families, and about our finances, about our clothes, about our house, about our car. You don't start out content. You don't come out of your mama and get a college diploma. There are some things that can only be. You have to learn how to be a wife that is content. You got to learn how to be a husband that is content. You got to learn how to be a person who is content with their financial life. It's not that you stop reaching for more. Content means I'm not going to go get more until what I'm reaching for has been manifested in my life. In other words, I, I, I want it, but I'm not going to go take it until God raises me up and puts it within the boundaries of what he's provided and blessed me with. Okay. All right. And then the second reason, and this is a good one. The second reason that people um, live above their means is they don't count. They just don't know how to count. Or they're just too ignorant to count. Some of the biggest problems financially in this room are not because you're not making enough money. It's because you don't know how to count. Jesus said, Luke 14, 28, who sets out to build a tower without first counting the cost of what it's going to be to finish it? And it's like, it's like for so many people that I, that I counsel, I counsel you on the phone. You're telling, you're telling me the same. It's the common, most common phrase I hear when I have counsel financial issues. I just don't know where the money's going. Don't laugh too loud. Everybody will know it's you. I just don't understand where the money is going. That is something spoken by a person that has not taken the time to count. Okay. So 
So you, you spent $7 at Starbucks and then you ran into Target for one thing and ran out with five things and, and you, 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 know, you, you, you stopped and got something for the kids and then you did that. And, and you don't even realize that $250 has been spent in an hour because you, it, it was all little things, $30 here, $7 there, $18 there, you know, $9.76 over here and then gas. And then the, but, but it all adds up. And you, you didn't count. You lost track of it because you didn't count. You didn't intend to live above your means, but you just didn't count. And you think that the bank should feel sorry for you <laughs> because you failed. Point number eight. Don't buy now and pay later. If you throw something at me, I'll throw it right back. Don't buy now and pay later. What commandment in the Ten Commandments does this go with? Look at uh, Exodus twenty fifteen: Thou shall not steal. Pastor, you're going to have to break that down. Okay. When you buy now, but pay later, you're stealing. From who? Your future self. God did not give you permission to steal from your own future. Your future belongs to him. Okay. I read this stat. I couldn't believe it. Do you know that 80% of tax refunds in America are spent before the refund money hits the account? <laughs> People find out what they're going to get and they go put whatever that amount is on a credit card and they will spend months and sometimes years paying it off. But here's the thing. When you buy now and pay later, you pay for the item sometimes two, three, four times over because you're paying the interest on it. When you're paying the interest on the purchase, you are stealing from the you six months from now that might need that money. The you six months from now that might have an opportunity to sow something very special into the kingdom of God. And you have to say no to your God because the past you six months prior made a dunderhead decision. And you're robbing from your future self when you buy now and you pay later. Now, listen, God don't mind you having a TV you can actually see. Don't mind that. And he don't mind you having a comfortable leather recliner to watch it in. But when you set up a 60-month payment plan, and you're paying for five years on a TV and a recliner. First of all, in five years, that TV is going to be obsolete. You're still going to be paying on that joker when it is a piece of trash that nobody even wants. You know, you can't even give an old TV away. I see you all the time posted, come pick this TV up. Nobody wants that thing. And you're still paying on it. You'd have had five TVs by now. The amount of money you paid, but you wanted to buy now, you wanted to pay later. You understand what I'm saying? Let me tell you the problem with this. As a human being, a created human being by God, God has hardwired you emotionally and mentally to hope. Say this, I am hardwired to hope. Let's look at hope. Romans 8, 24. Put that on the screen if you can. If you can. Romans 8, 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is... You better read this with me. Look at this. But hope that is seen is not... Hold on. Let's, let's look at that together. Hope that is seen, realized, or possessed is not hope. Because why does one still hope for what he's got or what he sees? Okay, okay. So God created you to see something 
and want it and have to work and plan and strategize and pray. And all while you're going through that process, you're standing in hope until the day where you get the ability and the manifestation to go in and take hold of what you hope for. When you do it like that, when you go after something that takes you a few months or you go after something that took you a year and you get it and then you own it, nobody's ever going to send you a letter about it. No one's ever going to try to collect it. No one's ever going to come knocking on the door for it. You take possession of it. There's a joy. You don't know how much I love you for teaching this to you. There's a joy that comes when you go and take possession like that. God intended for you to enjoy your life and enjoy your possessions. If you're going to buy something like that, at least enjoy it. Right? Why would you spend so much money for something you don't even enjoy? But that's what we do. When we buy now and pay later, two years down the road, you'll be looking at that TV and that TV will be making you sick. You'll hate that TV. You'll want to throw something at that TV when that, when that, because you don't know what's going to happen 24 months from now, you know, you don't know what's going to happen 36 months from now. You, you can buy it, take it home today and spend the next 36 months. If you send a hundred dollars a month for 36 months, you don't know what's going to happen. You may be in a bad situation and need that money. The Bible says money is a defense. You may be in a situation where you need those extra resources. You don't know the future. And, and you're, you're tying yourself up in knots, continuing to make these purchases because you never learned about delayed gratification and you never learned about standing in hope and praying for something and saving for something and believing for something, believing God for a sale. I've seen him do it, believing God for extra income to come in and but stay in put and standing strong within your means until the ability comes to get that thing. And, you know, the other thing that that does. It's also the real want test, because if you spend six months saving and preparing for that thing, there may come a day where your want changes. Have you ever wanted something really, really bad? And then three months later, I'm so glad I didn't get that. I'm so glad I didn't. <laughs> okay. Don't buy now. Pay later. I'm going to breeze through these next two. Be, number nine, be a good witness. Be a good witness. Everybody say a good witness. Say it again, a good witness. This is from Exodus 20, 16, where he says, do not bear false witness. So I want you to be a good witness. Don't bear false witness. How you conduct your finances should be a, wis a witness to the rest of the world about the strength of God's prosperity and the wisdom of his word flowing in your life. Uh, when you drive up and everyone in your neighborhood knows you're a believer, knows you're a Christian, and you drive up and your roof is falling apart, but you got a new sound system in the Cadillac. That is a terrible witness. And you know the insurance company paid you to fix that roof and you took that money that they gave you to fix it. got your cousin Craig to go and put some aluminum foil on that thing and you just have been going forward ever since it's it's a bad it's a bad witness it's a bad witness okay how you conduct yourself fine you know when when people are in when people are in difficulty when they're in trouble and you're able to bless them without ever expecting anything back and you're not doing it with consternation and you're, you're not stressed out about it because you're because you're blessed. You got it. You can do it. It's a witness. You know, it says something about God in your life. It says something about who you are. It says something about your faith. So you want to bear. Don't don't bear a false witness. The, the, the commandment in the Ten Commandments says don't bear false witness against your neighbor. But let's do a little deduction there. If we shouldn't bear false witness about our neighbor, how much more should we not bear false witness about our God? You know, knowing what we know, 
being exposed to what we've been exposed to. We are too blessed, we're too educated, and we know too much to be living our lives making dumb financial decisions. Our God has been good to us. He's given us his word. He's given us good teaching. He's given us good role models. He's put good people around us in our lives. We need to stand up, get mature, and become good witnesses everywhere we go. Our God is a blessed God. We are blessed people. Our children are blessed. Our homes are blessed. Our church is blessed. Our finances are blessed. Our health is blessed. We are blessed when we come in. We are blessed when we go out. We are blessed in the city, but we are blessed in the field. We are blessed in our uprising, and we are blessed in our down setting. We are lenders and not borrowers. We are the head and not the tail. We are above holy and not beneath because God is with us. Throw up your hands and say, I am blessed. Stand to your feet and give God a praise in the house. Stand to your feet. Give God praise in the house. Did the word bless you today? Well, 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 real quick, give God praise for all the technicians that made it happen. They made it happen up there. They had to, they had to unplug like seven computers and then plug seven more in and do all kind of stuff. Thank you guys upstairs. And we're going to post all the notes on these in social media in case we miss some. Number 10. Number 10. You can remain standing. Number 10. Be content. Okay. Why do I put that? Number 10. Why do I put that? That, that last commandment, the 10th commandment is don't covet what your neighbor has. Don't covet his wife. Don't covet his house. Don't covet his ox. Don't covet, don't covet what your neighbor has. Contentment breaks covetousness. One of the greatest sins that many of us are guilty of committing and really, it's, it's, it's our fault, but, but it's not our fault alone. Social media is an engine for producing covetousness, okay? You look at what this influencer has that they're selling, and, and you think if you bought what they are selling, you know, there's, there's this coveting thing going on. The thing that breaks covetousness is contentment. And again, I told you, contentment is a learned behavior. So watch this. If you just go in reverse order, I don't have time to do it with you. I, I belabored you enough today. But if you go in reverse order and you look at all the commandments and you apply each of them, those commandments in order will teach your heart to be content. Remember I told you contentment's a learned behavior? Well, how do I take the class? You apply the Ten Commandments for financial success. You practice, apply, and practice, apply, and practice. I don't care about perspective in this message. This isn't about what you believe. It's about what you do. This isn't about what you confess. This is about what you do. Okay. Some of you are breaking God's financial commandments every single day with every decision that you make and wondering why it's not working. Okay. And it'd be so derelict and irresponsible and just a total failure on my part to know it and see it, not come in here and talk to you about it. Okay. 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 If you haven't tithed this week yet, repent and get an envelope or get your phone out and give God the 10% that his word says is his. 10%, listen to me, 10% of all of your income. It doesn't just mean your main salary. That, that side job you did and you got 200 bucks, 20 bucks belongs to God. He said, bring all the tithe, okay? All the tithe. And then those of you that never offer God anything, you come to this church week after week, but you never offer God anything. In Malachi 3, when he talks about the people robbing him, he said, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. You've been holding yourself back from me. God said that. He said, try me in these things, in tithes and offerings, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have the room to receive. 
or I'll take you inside the gate. Okay. I'll, I'll open up what's inside of the walls and let you stand and live and walk in the supernatural provision and the blessing of God. Okay. Anytime an offering is taken like we're about to do right now, it's always a good practice to either put your hand on your heart or just bow your head and say, Holy Spirit, I'm available to you. What you would have me to give, I'm your servant. And what you would have me to give, I'll never hold it back from you. Speak to my heart. Let it come up in my spirit. Let it come up in my mind what I should serve you with and honor you with today. It's always a good thing to do. If you've not been tithing right, if you're holding back a portion of it, fix it. Get it right. Put God first. That's the first step of a list of 10 commandments that will help you train and teach your heart how to be content. As you make these decisions, as you pray these prayers, as you deal with your own obedience and your own heart, it's off of me now. I feel it. Hallelujah. It's off of me now. And it is on you. Father, I pray you bless your people. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for the clarity, the bright, shining clarity and the instruction that your word gives. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you lead your people, your children, the ones you love, that you lead them in the paths of righteousness, right standing with you, that you lead them in the paths of wisdom as it pertains to their finances. And Lord, I pray you bless them abundantly. Let the blessing of the Lord rain on them. Let their financial lives be turned around. Let everything that is chasing them financially run into the wall of your favor that surrounds them like a shield. Let the blessing and the prosperity of God himself come into their homes. Let the blessing and the prosperity of God himself come into their bank accounts and into their thinking. Let creative ideas and multiplication strategies come into their lives and into their thinking. I release prosperity right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I release an anointing of prosperity, an oil of prosperity over the lives of the people. In Jesus name we pray. Somebody say, I receive it. The Lord bless you. I got more strategic information on this topic I'll be sharing next Sunday. Put God first next week. Not just financially. Put him first by organizing and strategizing your life to be here. Online is great, but you need to be here. Do whatever it takes to be here next Sunday. The Lord bless you. We love you so much. You have something you want to give, need to give, need to fix. Come down here in the front. God bless you.